Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the 2017 University Librarians Forum. My name's Wendy Abbott. I'm a university librarian at Bond University and I'm convener for QLOC. I'll first acknowledge um, the traditional owners. In keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where QUT now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. I wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QUT community. So thanks to QUT uh, Library and the Cube for hosting this event. Um, and there's probably just a couple of housekeeping things I need to say first up. You know that um, there are exits on either side of the room. The bathrooms uh, are to out this door to the left, or if you go out that door, you go around the back. And if uh, in some, uh, for some unknown reason, we have to do an evacuation, we just all have to do what um, the announcements tell us. So today, we are delighted to have Francis Eden as our guest speaker. Uh, and university librarians or their representatives will um, give, um, will deliver a lightning talk, a two minute talk about their poster. Uh, now you probably all know all this, but just to remind you all, we're using the Slido app to take questions, which means that you as the audience and all our participants out in Zoom land can uh, participate in the event. So the Slido code is UL Forum 17. So um, can I just have a quick check how many people have set themselves up with Slido to ask questions? Some people have. Well, if you haven't, you can ask your colleague to put a question on for you. And one of the ways that Slido works is that it will allow you to uh, tick uh, the questions that somebody else has asked. And, and in that way, you endorse that question and, and raise it up the list to, as a more important question. So we will, as I said, we will have questions at the end of uh, Francis's talk and at the end of the university uh, librarians' presentations. Um, and you will be asked after the session, uh, as you go down to the cube and have a look at all the different posters down there, we'll be asking you to vote for your favourite posters. Um, and there is a link to a Survey Monkey survey where you can put in your votes. Um, and I think all the Zoomers have been sent the links to the posters which are on the wiki. So even after you leave here, you'll be able to see where, see the posters from the wiki, from the QLOC wiki. So the University Librarians posters have been on the screen in the cube since one o'clock and all the remaining posters will come up at four o'clock, just before we get down there. So another app for everybody to pay attention to and to and know about is the Layer app. It's another thing that um, Rachel would have told you all about. So the Layer app um, will let you um, scan the posters and see any associated content. So that's uh, another way to enhance what it is you see on the screens down there. I would like to thank very much everybody who has been involved in making posters. I know that um, uh, Rachel has been in close contact with many of you. Um, and many of us have learnt some new skills uh, as we've gotten involved in creating posters and finding out about layers and all, all things digital to do with our digital posters. So it's been um, a bit of a learning experience for, for many of us, speaking for myself anyway. So, and as you know, at the end of the formal proceedings, the drinks and canapes will be served from 4.15 in the queue. So before I go on to um, introduce, so. On the screen there, obviously you see the outline of our session for this afternoon. So before I go on to um, introduce Fran though, I just wanted to touch on a few of the highlights for Kula this year. So um, as um, is um, our normal uh, activities, workshops, and increasingly now webinars are being planned and organized and delivered for everybody. Uh, we've got three uh, workshops have already been held, one to go on library carpentry. Uh, we've had a couple of webinars already and we've got another webinar coming up uh, on the 8th of November. For the working parties, there were lots of meetings during the year. I think we had probably more meetings than ever. 
um, where the working parties were getting together, having their meetings and planning their activities. We have a new reference group, the Indigenous Strategy Reference Group, which is focusing on uh, how we can provide better support for Indigenous students in our universities and in our libraries. Um, and the Information Communication Technology Working Party did the Technology Library Survey on behalf of the entire Australian and New Zealand um, University Libraries community. So, and they got a very good response rate. So we're doing that on behalf of the whole community and feeding that information in through call. One of our new initiatives for um, this year has been, uh, or late 2016, was to offer professional development scholarships. So up to $1,000 is available to um, Hulock members. Um, if you are interested, um, you need to wait for the call for submissions, um, develop your proposal and submit it, and the successful um, uh, recipients then get to go and do their um, nominated um, professional development activity. So on the screen, you can see we've had um, two rounds now. The green was the first round and the second round is the blue round. So I think that all those people who were fortunate to attend uh, professional development activities on a QLOC scholarship, they I think they learnt two or three times out of the same activity because they got to learn for themselves when they went. They got to come back and inform all their colleagues about what they'd learned, and then they get to um, impart all their learnings to QLOC. So um, it's really uh, taking advantage of um, some really good staff development opportunity, opportunities. And as you can see, some people um, have done things all over the country, and we have somebody uh, who I think has just come back from the Digital Library Federation Forum in Pittsburgh. So, you know. Um, quite a range of different activities there. So I think there's another round open right now and uh, it is due to close on the 24th of November. So there's still time to get your submission in if you're interested. So our guest speaker today is Frances Eden, Director High Q and Library Services at QUT. Frances has had 20 years experience in the education industry. She began her career as a secondary teacher before working for Pearson Education for many years. Fran joined QUT in 2014 of director, as Director of E-Learning Services and is now, as I said, Director High Q and Library Services. So I'll ask, um, Thanks, Wendy. Brian, oh, come up. Mike's working, that's great. <laughs> hi, all. I'm just going to be watching the camera as I do this because I have to say hi to the Zoomers if I stand there. So, thank you very much. Um, we good? good? Okay. Great to see so many new faces. Many of you haven't seen me either. Hopefully all the QUT librarians have by now though. Um, so I just stepped into the role of uh, Director of HiQ and Library only three months ago. It only seems like a few weeks it's been flying by. So it was a bit daunting to find that I was asked to come and speak in front of QLOC. So I think, well, what, what can I present? I haven't been in the libraries for very long. So I said, well, what's the topic? And when I heard it was um, innovation and disruption, I felt a lot more comfortable. So after my many years in education, I've had a lot to do with disruption and innovation. I'm not saying I did it all well, but I've had a lot to do with it. Um, so after I was a teacher um, in drama and English, I decided I'm interested in business and I love universities. My mum was a university lecturer here at QUT and it was in my blood. And so I joined Pearson Education um, back then as a sales rep where I learned a hell of a lot about service. And after that, I became a publisher and then became editor in chief where I was involved in the disruption that has been pounding on publishers for many years as universities. But we really got hit hard about 15 years ago. As you guys will know, the resources sales are starting to go down. So we're hitting disruption, right? And so we had to start reinventing ourselves. What's our identity? What's our why? As a result, we started to focus less on the textbooks and more on the online resources, which needed a lot of innovation. And one of the things I remember having to do, though it broke my heart, and I think we all have to consider this, is what do we stop doing 
I remember once I had to stand up in front of the big team at Pearson and say we are cutting back 30% of our publishing program. Now, these are publishers. Their heart's in it. These people have to talk to authors. Over here are the sales reps. They go, what? well, you can't do that. But we had to do that to free up the staff to innovate and focus on digital products. And it was the right decision to make. And looking back, the authors who had those smaller books went off to other beautiful niche publishing companies who were very happy to work with them. The publishers stayed with us or again chose some niche publishers. And the sales team had other products to sell. And we were better helping our students who were demanding us from us different things. So this is, um, um, and so then I moved from there into e-learning services. So I don't know if the universities have a group like that. So we look after the learning and teaching technologies. So there was a lot of innovation there. And then I stepped in this role a few months ago. So this equation was very interesting to me. I was pondering it for a while. I definitely would say that disruption can lead to innovation. And innovation can lead to disruption. But it does not always. And this is what interests me. I have been involved in many experiments and innovations, but they have not always led to true disruption. And by that, I mean it replaces what we do. It's that blank piece of paper where we say, let's talk to our users and reimagine what we can do in this space. Let's look at the whole enterprise, end-to-end -end user experience, and let's see what we can do to change what we are doing now, which has worked so beautifully. And we are experts in that area, but it works so beautifully. Why would we change it? We need to disrupt and cater for our new users. I've always loved innovation. I've always been a bit of an entrepreneur. I think I started off as a very lazy entrepreneur because my first invention was when I was a teenager, why can't something pick the doona up off me, lift me and roll me over and put the doona back down on me? Or why can't I have back then push button televisions, a remote control to change this? So my family and I ended up with a stick with a robot finger on the end. So I was always like that. And I do think I frustrate my family because I'm, I'm always saying, well, do that. We should sell that. We should start that business. I don't often do it. But luckily, I've had teams around me who will pull that off. Now, the reason I'm interested in talking to you today is a call from action, really, that I think we could be playing a bigger innovation game. When I was in e-learning services, this is how many experiments and innovations we were working on starting in 2016. We did everything right. We found out what the user needed. We worked with the academics, not just in our little silo. We worked with the students as well. So we came up with um, an app. So if you're a nursing, uh, a nursing student who's out on prac, it's very scary out in the hospital system. I was there. I did that for a while. So this app enabled you to connect to other trainee nurses and physios, so cross-discipline, which the academics liked. We had a tool that could tell if the students are buying their assignments. We had peer-to-peer peer, peer -peer education. We have a tool that we experimented with that we can have online um, assessments. And we can tell that's you doing the assessment, authenticating the student. We had these great things. I was ticking off the, yes, we're doing experiments. Yes, boss, we're innovating. But in the end of the game, how many of those experiments really scaled to make sure that we have a big impact on our students? So for me, this was a bit frustrating. To be fair, I'm, I'm being a little bit unfair, because a lot of those experiments a lot of those experiments were for one unit or one course or to solve one problem. There were a few there that could have been leveraged across the university, but the barrier was lack of money, lack of time, lack of resources, and lack of strategy support from above and down. And I found the same thing at Pearson. I hired someone to do nothing but innovation, gave her the world. I said, talk to the global partners, let's come up with something new. And we did, and it was bloody brilliant and it did not launch, so it did not scale because of these barriers we face. So I'm not saying that we have to stop doing these incremental innovations. They're very important. They do help those unique user groups, and they're part of what we all do as workers. We're creators. We should be doing new things to help the users. But what I'm interested in is can we spend more of those resources and time also looking at this top space 
So this is a grid that came from PwC, from a Disruption Innovation Leadership course. It was one at QT recently. I didn't see this leadership piece myself, this course, but I got given this grid because I'm always going on about innovation. And it speaks to what I'm saying. I have been playing. I don't know about you guys, maybe not. I have been playing a lot in this space here. I would like to move up and across which will give us more scale. It says market scale here, but it could be enterprise scale. And I'd like to move down and up. It says business model change, services change, to play in this space up here as well. And frankly, I think when you get this right, though it's complex, it's easier to roll out because you've got the powers that be behind you and the resources you need, and usually working across silos. Now, recently, I've had the opportunity to be involved in something like this at the end of the innovation. And a few people here asked me to talk today about HiQ, and I'm leading HiQ too. So I won't include QUT people here, so keep your hands down. So from others outside of QUT, who's heard of HiQ at QUT? Okay, so you've been hearing about it. I would say that HiQ is a more disruptive innovation, maybe not the Christensen definition, but it's an innovation that has truly disrupted the way we deliver services at QUT, and it has had an impact on the students. I have no doubt I'm talking to them, it has helped, and it has captured the imagination of staff across QUT. Now, this isn't novel to QUT. To explore this new way to roll out student services, um, Judy Stocker, DVC Tills, and her team they travelled around to other universities, maybe your universities, and collected ideas. We're not new in this space. But the, it all started with Ernst & Young coming to QUT and helping us think about how we can enhance student experience, not learning, not research, experience. That was the trigger. And then September last year, the Vice Chancellor marched down to Judy's office and said, right, we need to do more here and we should do it quickly. The students are telling us that the services are great when they find them. The service is great if they know they exist. And this was the problem. It was so problematic. There are over 50 phone numbers, certainly over 50 emails. Services were provided to students across the campuses, behind the doors, over the counters. How, we can, make, how can we make their lives easier? That's how HiQ was born. So it was basically picking up all the service providers and putting them into one physical space. I'm simplifying it a bit, but that's the aim. One physical space and one digital space, so a couple of digital entity points for the students to get the answer they need when they want it. So it doesn't matter if they, they want to find, how do I get my ID card? I'm late with my assignment, what should I do? I hate this unit, why did I choose this course? The parking here sucks. Whatever it was, they wanted to talk to us about, we had one point of call for them to come through. Three of the main services it picked up was library services. And it's in the library buildings. So that's the differentiating point here. I think it was the speed it was done and the fact that they brought these services together and put them in the library buildings. And why is that a good idea? Because we're the hub of the university, we're the engine room of the university. I think that we're the portal for students and public and academics. So there it went, high Q physical space on both campuses in the university. And it happened very quickly in seven months because it was a minimal viable product launch. We didn't get it right. We didn't go for perfect all the time. And we involved the students. So here's a little image for people who haven't seen it and I'll show you some more. The young woman in the orange shirt is a high Q concierge. There's a tier model. High Q concierge is a student who helps a student. So that's tier one. It's one of the entry points. They're there when the students come into the space, they've got the little orange iPad, like the Apple store, and they say, hi, how can I help you? And then they triage those queries to where it needs to go to more specialist areas of service. One of the most wonderful things they did for this, I believe, was involve the students in the creation of it. So students were involved in the design, the build and the delivery. And I should have noted those um, concierge students were actually paid for their work. They're not volunteers, which I think is as it should be. They helped us with the prototype, the alpha of the app, the spaces, the furniture, and they also helped us design the experience for the students. 
And we didn't only go to the students, we actually went outside the university to find some experts in creating customer experience. Um, the company was called 8 Inc. Has anyone heard of 8 Inc? INC? These guys came up with the concept plan for the Apple stores, which is why the iPads are so um, important to us in our experience. So they came in as this made us, we were the inexpert. We don't understand customer experience as much as you do because you live and breathe this. And they came and worked with the students and us. And this is the feeling we want for our students. QUT gets me. They're on point. This is my space. I'm not alone and I am inspired. This is the experience we're wanting to create. And we do our best to ensure we're assessing our services against that experience. Here's an image of the tiers then for you. So tier zero is self-service. When you come into the space, there's computers that you can get your information on and there's also an app. It's a very little word app, but it's very complex to create. And we're still incrementally improving that app. Tier one is the peer concierge in the orange shirt, the peer-to-peer -peer student who triages the queries. If they can solve it on the spot, fantastic. If it's starting to take too long or they can't solve it, it goes up to tier two, which is a high queue advisors. The advisors, which is staff from our university in, say, library, IT, administration, picked up and put into the space to work together with the students. And if high queue advisors is not to their level, it was a higher level tier three query, it then is a warm handover to that group. Some tier three specialists sit within our physical area. And we'd like to see more of that. That would be um, counselling, equity, careers advice, study support and in-depth faculty queries. Here's a quick image of the space. The thing to know here is when the students come in, tier one is first, very visible. The kids and students in their orange shirt, then into tier two in their blue shirts, IT, library administration, tier three sitting behind them in, in their booths as well, counselling, study support, etc. Some private spaces at the back, activity room, coffee shop. It's a very active space. And this is the Gardens Point map. We have a smaller version at Kelvin Grove. So it's truly this integrated service model where we have the physical and a big contact centre plus the app and email and chat. I thought it'd be interesting to show you what's on the app because people often ask about that, so you can read up there. And so far, I actually think it's now 22,000 downloads for the app. So we've got a bit of a way to go there because we have 48,000 students, but we're getting there. The name, High Q, sort of like High QT. Some people thought it was like High and IQ. You know what? It's not up to us. It was up to the students. They made it up. The student focus group came together. They decided on the name. And I remember being in ELS when everyone said, it's high Q. And some of my staff were going, what the hell does that mean? High Q? That's ridiculous. I said, Shh, it's not up to us. It's up to the students. They love it. And then the marketing company loved it too. And the VC didn't have a say. And that is novel for a university. And it really has grown on us. It says to them, hi. It's that word, the icon, hi. It's very friendly. And I think the, uh, the imaging is being great. There's the front, and you can see the orange flags and the high queue sign, the concierge, the blue uniform for tier two, and the app. There's another image of the very active space. We also have a great big digital screen, which is um, gesture activated. So downstairs we've got touch. It's gesture, you can grab and pull and move things around and the uh, concierge staff can pull something up on the iPad and throw it up into the screen if you're talking to more students. So this has been a great thing for me to be watching on the side, a true disruptive innovation and it has changed the culture of our university. I do believe that's the case. When we're running smaller innovations, you usually have to go, the, the thing about universities I found coming from corporate is to move something along, you have to go and visit everybody and there's lots of stakeholder management and you have to bring them in, coerce them, advocate and let's all move together. And that can be kind of frustrating. The difference with this is the VC said, VC said we're going to do something, 
he put someone on the case who's very good at output and making things happen. They freed staff up to pull it off, and it happened in seven months. And I was amazed by what that did for staff motivation across the university. It's like the shoulders are back. We're quite proud of what QUT are doing. It's like, it's, we knew we'd be doing something soon. We knew something had to be done to help our users, and here we are. So I think that could also happen at other universities. So the lessons I've taken away from this, oh, that's the sentiment too. So yeah, they love it. The students do love it. The staff who pulled it off are tired. <laughs> They're really tired. And we've still got a lot of problems to work through in the back end, but the user doesn't know about any of those problems. So we're about to go into phase two, which will finish in February. Okay, dealing with the spaces, dealing with the app, dealing with the knowledge management system. How do the concierges get fast answers using the system we have? So there's a lot yet to do in the background. These are the lessons I've taken away from this innovation. Firstly, driving from the top. I think that's most important because, as I say, it changes the culture of the university, motivates people, helps with change management, makes things happen, gives you the resources, how can we help with that, though? That can make you think, well, well, I'm not at the top. How can I influence this? I do believe if we work across silos, we can come up with ideas that we can table for the top. Because I think often for leaders, we go to them with problems instead of actually taking some time to put a plan in place and say, here are a couple of options. What do you think? And if you put the user first, that does free up the funding because it does help with the university reputation and what we're supposed to be doing. Lesson two is to think big, but do as little as you can. OK, so there I'm being a bit cheeky. But what I'm talking about is that minimal viable product being agile and acting lean and giving them just enough features to appease and then to continually getting feedback from the users on how to improve. They don't mind that. The, the students love it. What do you think? It's not there yet. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, do this. How about that? So that's, that's a very good way to do things. And you can get some wins on the board, those low-hanging fruit. Uh, the third one, I've got four. The third one is co-designing with users. I learned this in ELS as well. We did a big review of the learning management system. And we're always rolling out improvements in functionality. And we're thinking, this is good. But actually, it isn't what the students wanted, or the academics. What they wanted us to do is to simplify, please. Stop throwing features at us. Just make it easier for me to find what I want when I want. And also, I think this meet them where they live. The fact that these students are on mobile. That's where they want to find their information. These students all go to the library. Let's go to where they are. I've always liked this image. I remember those old tomato bottles. Remember the bashing the bottom of it to get the source out? So a focus on designing the experience, not to design the product. Another area where we need to focus, and we did this in ELS, is we're really good at functional, reliable, usable services. We were fantastic at that, but we forgot the pleasure piece, the delight factor. And simplifying gives the users that delight. Easy to say, hard to do, but if you actually talk with your users, you'll find out exactly what they do want. But to help the students, we can't do it in silos. You have to pull the team together. We need to focus end to end on that user experience and bring in our buddies from student services, from IT, from careers and counselling, whoever runs a coffee shop. It doesn't matter. We need to come together and create solutions together, be in expert and go out we, they couldn't have pulled this out if we didn't go to vendors. Someone helped us with the gesture screen. Someone helped us with the experience. Someone helped us design the space. And that enabled it to move along faster. So pull the team together. So really, to recap, I do think that we need to focus more on innovation that leads to disruption, bigger disruption to help our users. And I think the library has a really big piece to play in this. As I said before, it is the hub. Everyone goes there. We are brokers for information. 
Sometimes I'm, I'm talking to Kim about why could we not broker human resources instead of physical resources? Bring together people who need to know something and need a solution to human capital. What if we were the center for some social problems, something we need to solve out there, and we help bring the people together to help solve it through the Students' Brain Trust, Academic Brains Trust, Research Brains Trust, we're like information distrib distributors, but could we be information brokers and deal with an, uh, a larger thought of what resources are? Again, thinking across the uni, though. They're just a couple of ideas, but I just think thinking big is my cry because I think we all need to learn those skills and it's a lot of fun <laughs> in that space and we can make a real difference to users. So this is what I'm challenging myself to do over this next year. And to do that, I'm going to have to carve out space with Kim and the other QUT staff here to come up with some, a, a next step and something that's novel. Okay? So they're my thoughts on disruption and innovation for today. Thank you. Do we have some questions or question time? Awesome debates or disagreements, that's absolutely fine. We're just going to put up the, um, the Slido questions as well. Okay. But in the meantime, does anybody have a question from the floor? Okay. Or ideas on how it could be done. Yes. Yeah. Great question. So where do we get the students from and will they change every year? So there's a strong um, peer volunteer program here at the university. So the first thing we did was look at those volunteers because they know a lot about the uni. Um, we'd focus on second year and so we'd also look at very highly um, successful second year students as well. And the thing is they'll stay with us for their second year and their third year and then they fly off into the world. Which, and there's a lot of money and time we spend on training. So that's a sad thing for all of us. But we hold on to them as much as we can. So that's how we approach that. Fran, would you like to take one of the questions from the Slido? So um, this one here has got four people. Oh, yeah, they would four like hands to... up. How do you rate if HiQ has been successful? It refers a little bit back to that slide I showed too quickly on how do the students grade the experience and how quickly it was solved. The first thing we did was put iPads at the exit points to the high queue space, so this is a physical space, and ask them to grade it on the way out, you know, so that we instantly get that feedback. Um, for the online or the contact centre, as soon as the service is finished, they get an email or I think it's only an email, I'm not sure if it'll be in chat to I think, where they say, how would you rate this service out of five and give us a reason if it's low. And we're still exploring how to do this, but we want to do it in a way where we're not sending out surveys. And we're having constant focus groups and we're getting, uh, we've got 200 app students who are giving us constant feedback on the app. I hope I've answered that question. So the top one now, how, how, how many staff are employed at the various tier levels? That's a challenging one. How long did they get trained? I don't think I have the answer to how many staff are at each level. I know that we have in high queue around 120 staff that includes casuals as well. So a lot of those are students. I think we would have brought in, I'd say, 10 to 15 tier two from the previous service areas. And then in the contact centre, when I'm down there, I look on the floor, I'd say there's about um, 25 to 30 in the contact centre. And what we're doing is the contact centre can be very stressful. So we're making sure that they can move from contact centre up to the physical space and then to chat and email so the pressure isn't too high on them, which will be really important for January and February. What were the pressure points for the project? Having to deliver. Oh my goodness. Um, look, even the day it was opening, there was something wrong with the gesture screen. 
Uh, so there was panic and they were running around and it was definitely the time uh, to deliver and ensuring we're looking after the wellness for the staff who were delivering it. And that first day when we opened and the students were coming in and the first day we actually started to get a lineup of students, which is the last thing we wanted. So that was high pressure. So it's quickly, how can we change this so that doesn't happen again? Yeah, this one I just answered. For the project itself, it was that delivering, absolutely. Um, oh, oh, also, pressure points for the project. We need a lot of experts on this from within the university as well. So the DVC Tills had to go, right, Michael, you know all about the app business. You're coming with me. You know, they're usually the guys for the tech. I'm sorry, John. You know all about um, student uh, user experience on, on the site. You're coming with me. And then I'm plucking you and I'm plucking you out. And those people are already busy on other projects. So she had to just go, sorry, this is a university priority. This is happening. And it actually worked well in the end because we should prioritise. Uh, has there been an impact on the number of librarian reference desk questions? I'm looking at Kim occasionally here because Kim Lewin has some knowledge of this area. Would you say, do we have um, a microphone? Sorry, Kim. Oh, Kim, talking to Mark. Sorry. If, if you just look at the raw data, it does look like there's a decrease, but how we break our data uh, down is into different categories. So there's a lot of directional, those that work on desk would know that. There's a lot of quite simplistic ones. So if you look at the data, it has changed, but it's because the concierge or that the more simplistic ones are answered at another point. So if you're just purely looking at desk stats, there is a reduction, but a reduction is also a good thing. Our, our aim is not to have humongous stats. That just means that everyone has to have some interaction to get what they want. So to, to have a, you know, a really reduced statistic model is a good thing. Did that answer? So, thanks, Kim. Kim Lewin. How are we going for time? Uh, it's great that people love Haiku, but how do you demonstrate value to the educational outcomes that would be very hard to find quant data on that. I don't know if you could do that, but what we do is get out of their way. If we simplify the services, we decrease the time they're looking for things, we get out of their way so they can get on with studying. And if they have any studying questions at all, they can come to talk to us as well. So instead of being at home and going, I'm confused, I'm distressed, I don't know if I should be in this university, they have someone to talk to, and guess who it is? It's a peer. No, it's not a scary older person like me. So I think that actually helps them. And the other thing is with the chat as well, that's a very unthreatening place to, to log in to get some assistance. Um, so, yeah. And they've still got the student, they've still got the study support at tier three. It's a very important service and it's the first service that's coming into the physical space with us. That's another group that looks after that area, but they're going to be in the library when the students want them. Last question. Uh, was it just about was it just about student experience or was there cost saving motivations for the university's bottom line? Do you know, that is a really good question. And coming from corporate, I'm always looking for efficiencies. This is actually a very expensive model, to be honest. And at the moment, I would not say that we've made any cost savings at all. I'm trying to figure out how we can bring in more efficiencies. Um, yes, uh, we didn't make redundant any service providers. We just brought them into new spaces and retrained. Yeah. Um, oh, I should say, though, because I was talking about that 30% cut in publishing before, the university is looking at other ways to do this. So there's been an in incredible time spent on um, IT services. We're very expensive in regards to IT. So we're looking where the repetition is there and trying to make savings so we can do more things like this. Uh, which one was it? Uh, were there other viable options for the location of the service? Where did it go? Yeah. 
have student inquiries across the university increased using Haiku? Now they know where to ask. We believe so, but it's very hard to get the data from the fragmented services, which is one of the benefits of this approach. There'll be one database to work from, but yes, we do believe that's the case. Okay. okay. How's so that? How's I that? Think, um, I think it's really um, got people going, these questions, so yeah. uh, but I think uh, we're just about um, out of time. So, Fran, I'd like to thank you so much for <laughs> a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Very, very topical. Okay. Thanks very much. Let's play a bigger innovation game. Okay. Thank you. Innovation yeah. equals disruption. <laughs> okay. So, we'll move on now to the next uh, part of our um, forum this afternoon where um, we are going to have um, each um, university librarian or their representative uh, give a short two-minute presentation on uh, their poster and the posters for the university's uh, university librarians are already down in the queue so you may have had a chance to have a look at those already um, and the idea of us presenting like this was really to be able to get all the university librarians to do a short presentation because when we ask um, the QLOC members what they really want at the QLOC University Librarians Forum, they usually ask, we just want to hear from the University Librarians. So um, this is uh, our attempt uh, to get everybody up here to speak. Um, and it's also been a bit of a challenge to us all to get our digital posters together and uh, sort it all out technologically. So um, not all of us did our own, I must confess. <laughs> Um, but I think as you will see, um, our presentations graphically illustrate how disruption comes in so many different forms. You know, there's technological, organisational change, environmental change, financial change, and the pace of that change and disruption is increasing. So I think it's a very relevant topic that we're talking about today. So um, now I have to do something here to get back to the PowerPoint. Okay, uh, yes, that'll do, thanks, yeah. So um, what we're going to ask each of the um, university librarians to do is to come up um, straight, you know, we won't go through any uh, formal um, introductions because that's the poster, the name. Um, we have a baton here, the baton will change hands and uh, each person gets two minutes and I think Sarah is going to time us two minutes each. It's going to be ding and then crash tackle after that maybe. <laughs> so um, without any further ado, I might get started on mine. Now don't start to share. Wait on. <laughs> i got to get my piece of paper ready. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Flash forward to 2030. 40% of jobs could be automated. Every job will change with more time spent focusing on people, thinking creatively and solving strategic problems. Routine manual tasks will diminish or disappear altogether. And children being born today will live to 100 and work until they're 70, changing the nature of careers and lifelong learning. So what are the key factors driving these changes? Widespread impacts of artificial intelligence and machine learning. In other words, the machines are getting smarter, taking over routine and manual tasks. Big data is already here, allowing us to, to mine vast quantities of data to make predictions and inform better decisions. New social technologies and a whole new media ecology will drive an unprecedented reorganisation in how we produce and create value for our organisations. And for universities, new technology will transform how students learn and participate, and corporate investment in learning will take over from the consumer and government-led model that we have today. But in response, librarians and libraries will continue to reinvent ourselves. We have done it for many years. By enhancing our organisational cultures to be more innovative and open to the opportunities that arise through disruptive change and by enhancing and developing our skills. And so these are some of the uh, things that we're trying to do at my university, at Bond. So we need a strategic innovation agenda. Senior managers need to lead by example. Staff at all levels must be, must be encouraged to innovate. 
and there has to be good teamwork across multi-functional um, sorts of teams. There needs to be much more, and this is something for librarians to take note of, willingness to take a risk and permission to fail. And training and development are increasingly important as a reward and recognition. But we still need to balance operational excellence with innovation. We are already on track to, develop, to developing some of the new skills we need. For example, librarians are adept at developing skills in new media literacies and um, you know, virtual collaboration, the sort of thing that we're, we're sort of doing this afternoon. But we also need novel and adaptive thinking, social intelligence and more computational thinking, more ability to deal with data. Okay. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> I didn't look over there deliberately. <laughs> Thank you. So that's me. Can't see me in the cube and there's more. Now, which one? Oh, no. All right. Thanks, Wendy. So I, uh, wrote up some lovely notes this morning and read them on the way over and it took about eight minutes. So um, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go with the notes and I'll just talk for a bit. So I often complain uh, and some of my staff will, will agree uh, that the library profession has been too conservative, too risk averse. We don't embrace innovation. Um, but I thought I'd take this opportunity to actually look over the past couple of uh, decades since we faced massive disruption and identify places where we actually have been quite innovative. And some of these are incremental innovations. Um, some of them are more disruptive. Uh, organize them along five themes. So developing new services, digitizing unique material, maximizing utility of print, redeveloping, redefining library spaces and collaboration. And each of those, I think importantly, has a strategic intent. So it's not just innovation for the sake of innovation. In terms of de developing new services, it would be around looking at uh, areas of library service that are in decline and ways we can find new ways uh, to provide value to the university, um, aligning with the university's strategic mission. So research data management, uh, OA publishing and repositories are a big example. In the case of repositories, for example, the library community was heavily involved in the open source development initiatives around eSpace and ePrints. Um, we've built platform to support open access, green open access, but also platforms that support ways to demonstrate um, the value of our university's research outputs. Digitizing unique materials. So uh, increasingly with our regular collections, we all buy the same stuff um, from a decreasing number of publishers in bigger and bigger packages. Special collections are the area where we have distinctive value and exposing those special collections through digitization is a key activity um, that's led to a lot of development of new and innovative tools. I've got three examples here from UQ, but I think any one of us would have uh, examples. Maximizing utility of print, so print still will remain an important part of our collections. Uh, from my perspective, we need to maximize the value of print, so make print more like E. Um, so services like Scan and Deliver, where we'll actually scan uh, article, articles um, or book chapters and send them online to students, which is what they expect. Oh, no, I didn't even make it. <laughs> All right, talk to me later. Thank you. Now, <laughs> oh, God, it's me. <laughs> I think this is a plot. <laughs> okay, don't start yet. Which, who's, who's, who am I ignoring? Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, disruption equals innovation. For Griffith University, um, this has certainly been a year of disruption, change, and new challenges. So the best description when I thought about it was being in a pinball machine and actually being the ball. Um, so moving between competing um, priorities, evolving expectations, uncertain contexts, and being hit from left field and cap catapulted off into the unknown. And at the same time, needing to keep the lights on, keep everything going, maintain mo momentum, deliver results, and have a high score. So it was quite difficult. So what are we bouncing off? We're bouncing off a new team. So we brought in um, Scholarly Resources and our, our library technology back into the library fold. 
Uh, we had a new te uh, leadership team at the highest level of Griffith, so there was a lot of changes there. New plans, academic plans and all the rest, which means you have to recalibrate where you're going. Um, and of course, the external uh, context, which we all know so well. Um, also internal to library and learning services, we had a staffing profile and service review in response to top level drivers. And that meant changes to roles, loss of positions and a new service model. Um, and there's more of that in one of our posters. Um, and we also had a, um, an on again, off again, new library project, uh, platform project. And at the same time, wrapping around the Griffiths, care, community, quality, all of the values that are really important. Mid-year, we had more disruption in um, the long, uh, the 25 years of INS, which was um, a combined library and IT service that was very successful, very popular, quite unique, um, was disestablished. Uh, we're still working through the divorce. Um, but it has meant that we have got new relationships and new changes. So what have been my leverages or my flippers to keep us all going? I've had two key mantras. Be stubborn about your goals, but flexible about your methods. And be analytic, analytical in your decision making, but compassionate in the execution of those decisions. And the levers that we've been looking at, Assets, we've been managing everything as an information asset of value to the organisation from low to go. People, who are our greatest asset, so investing time and effort in aligning, communicating and motivating them through turbulence. Spaces, we've got new opportunities to expand and experiment. Resources, um, the same for our scholarly resources and services, and there's another poster, just a bit of um, promotion. Uh, we have new friends, new tables to sit at, new opportunities. And technology, we're no longer in INS um, and having that close relationship with our IT services, but we've brought IT robustness uh, to all of our projects, big and small. So disruption equals innovation, and for us it's been about finding new ways to move from being flipped about to leveraging those flippers to make the big scores and become the pinball wizards of our new groups. Thank you. <laughs> Put it under the bed. <laughs> Can't stop it. Thank you very much, Maureen. So we'll move along to Kim. Are you timing that? Oh, okay. Hello, I'm Kim Lewin. I'm not a university librarian. I'm associate director here at QUT. So I ticked Fran's box when I kept mine very simple. And I'm going to give you some examples. So very recently, I bought a new clothes dryer. I feel the cold and I will often on a cold day put my dry clothes in a clothes dryer to warm them up so that they're warm when I put them on. My new clothes dryer, which is a smart machine that Wendy referred to, it detects that my clothes are dry and it won't put the heat on. <laughs> Last weekend, I went to wash my car at uh, another, not, not at my home, at another property, and I couldn't find the nozzle for the hose. My hose is smart and it won't let water come out unless something is clicked into the end. So I had to wash my car with a sprinkler because that's all that I could find. <laughs> so these are examples of innovation. Was I asked for my input in regard to these innovative ideas? Clearly not. Um, <laughs> And, and you'll see that what I have added to this very simplistic graph is, I don't think disruption equals innovation. I think the user experience determines our improvement cycle. And that's something that we have to continually do to be talking to our users, to be clear about what they want. We have to stop looking just internally at each other and what we do. What, what are those um, corporations or businesses that we really need to benchmark and look who have really reinvented themselves. 
Um, there are lots of them. McDonald's does it with how they deliver their service, the menus that they provide. Uber, love them or hate them, they are here, they are making a dent in the market and they do some really good um, different services as part of their transport services. They'll have different things where you can also get ice cream, they'll bring puppies to you to pat. Once again, that's not the business that they're in, but it adds to the value of that business. Um, we need to be passionate and relentless with what we do. Once you have that passion, you, you just have this drive to, to really be connected and to deliver uh, what your students want. And there is no end date to this. You never, ever get to a place to say, I'm done, I can sit back and take a breath. It, it's just a continuous um, cycle. The, we, we need to thrive instead of survive. And we've all noted that there is a lot of disruption, that we are incredibly busy, and we, we shouldn't just be surviving. We should be thriving. Our businesses should be thriving and our service models should be thriving. And as France pointed out with HiQ, we may not get it right the first time, and that's okay. And if we had sat with HiQ and planned it till the nth degree, we would not have that space that we have now. We'd still be planning. And by the time we figured it out, our user base will have moved on to something else perhaps. So we, we do need to be very um, timely in what we're doing and what we're saying. Um, and and uh, as I say to staff all of the time, make your decisions based on that customer experience. We often get caught up in different blockages. We often get caught up in different things in regard to, well, what about us? How is that going to look for us? Can we make that work? You have to start at that end and say, this is what I want to deliver and then work backwards. And then how are we going to put that in place? And what do I have to either change or stop doing to put that into place? Um, uh, a creative culture, a culture of creativity. We need to, we, we have a program here, some of you may know it or heard of it, called Off the Grid. It's where we give staff permission to stop what they're doing and work on some innovative idea that they've had. All they need to do is create a poster at the end of that uh, period that they're allocated, but it really gives them permission and it, it uh, highlights that we put value on innovation because we all know our, with our day-to-day -day tasks that we get caught up in things and we kind of go, I haven't got time for that. And I haven't got time for anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. So, moving right along. Come on. Everyone's being so well behaved and getting through their presentations quickly. Time is elastic. <laughs> I'm going to time myself so that I can. I'm, I'm only going to take two. Um, so um, simple is good. Um, so any innovation, whether it's technology driven or it's an emerging strategic priority, will eventually impact staff. And if it's disruptive enough, it will impact the way an organisation works and is structured. So my poster focuses on organisational change and looks at three phases, preparing for change, working through change and building on the changed state. So with preparing for change, in our case at USQ, the library hadn't been through a great deal of change previously and we needed to invest time and effort in our staff to help them gain a better understanding not just of our own institution but the higher education sector and trends and developments in the library and information sector. So we made a lot of effort to give them the means and opportunity to develop an understanding of why change was needed um, and we needed them to have both an emotional buy-in to the university's values and an intellectual buy-in to the university's mission and strategy. So when staff have that kind of buy-in where they really deeply understand why we do what we do and how we do what we do, then the value proposition is that the way they give service changes and they enhance our reputation by that deep level of understanding. So the second phase is involving staff in the change itself. So at USQ, we thought it was very important to give library staff themselves a genuine opportunity to contribute to the shaping of the future library. So we involved all staff in a variety of processes and activities that allowed us, them to give us ideas about what might be best for USQ. So when we entered into the formal change process, they could see many of their own ideas reflected in the proposal. And as we moved through that process, their feedback was again reflected in changes to the proposal. 
um, oh gosh, I'm <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> uh, sorry. Um, and we were also keen to acknowledge that the process might be messy and we're probably not going to get it right, um, but that we would make our best, best um, uh, efforts at making decisions based on good evidence, but then if we needed to change what we were doing, we would have to change what we were doing. So we're now in the building phase. So one year into the new structure, we're figuring out what worked and what didn't work, and we're seeing whether we need to make more changes to realise the vision. So we're also concentrating on how, from, a, from building a structure, we develop a culture that we need to take full advantage of the changes that we've made. And to that end, we're focusing on the three Ps, play, per purpose and potential to help staff identify strong motivations for their work so that we can build a high performance work culture. So the three Ps I can talk about more when we're um, down, at, down the bottom at the poster session. Um, so I'm not a university librarian either, I'm State Librarian CEO at State Library of Queensland and what I'm going to talk to you about today is digital disruption of legal deposit. And I'm sure you are all familiar with legal deposit, but did you know that it actually has its origins in France with King Francois I in the 16th century when he was keen to build his own personal library so decreed that everyone had to deposit a book with his library. Um, of course, uh, jurisdictions around the world have taken up legal deposit as a way to document their publishing. Australia's model is based on Great Britain and it has its origins in the, um, the mechanism that was originated by Sir Thomas Bodley in 1610 when all publishers or uh, when works from the stationers' company were required to be pub uh, deposited to the Oxford University. So that's the origins of the Bodleian Library. Across Australia, each of the states and the National Library has legal deposit. And uh, you'd be aware that under legal deposit, publishers must deposit a copy of every item that they publish. In 2016, the Copyright Act, which governs the legal deposit for the National Library of Australia was changed. And it, the main change to it was that it now included digital deposit. So p digital publications were required to be deposited with the National Library. This was a game changer because it now meant that the National and State Libraries Australasia, or NASLA, could actually move forward on their collaboration to have a national de digital deposit network. Not all uh, state libraries in Australia have digital deposit. Queensland does, but the fact that the National Library has it, it was actually a game changer. So over the last four years, NASLA has been working on developing the National Digital Deposit Network and, no, <laughs> and uh, the good news is much of that time has been working up the pilot and the model. We will develop a ingestion tool which will enable publishers to self-deposit and that will be run, the big publishers will do that through the National Library, which means that the state libraries can focus on the local jurisdiction. So we will focus on the Queensland small publishers. The biggest feat has been getting the agreement signed because we're dealing with a deed that needs to cover each jurisdiction in Australia and each jurisdiction has different legal requirements. The good news is that we will sign that agreement in November Yes, and, uh, and we will move forward on the project and the next stage of the pilot will take us through to about middle next year. This is a significant digital disruption and Australia will lead the world in actually having this uh, mechanism in place um, in the next um, year or so. If there's any questions, they go to Anna Rownick in the back row. Anna has spent the most of the last four years working on this project and representing Queensland. But I think as Australians, we can be very proud again of the Australian library movement because we've actually established a, a really um, innovative service for our, uh, our country. Thank you. Okay. So now we have Sharon. Lenord from um, Sunshine Coast. So we have a few moments. I'm a woman of few words. I probably won't need extra time. 
Um, I'm not a university librarian either. My university librarian, in her own words, is happily swanning around Europe and the UK somewhere, so she's not missing any of you. And, and I, she very kindly said to me, would you mind filling in for this? I, no worries, so here I am. Um, like everyone, USC has experienced di disruption due to the advances in technology, changes in the higher education sector and student expectations. In addition to those factors, a major source of disruption for USC has been growth and the rapid expansion of our geographic footprint. I often say where most universities probably grow their numbers by increasing enrolments in a particular course, we'll take on something like law or engineering or why not a whole new site or campus. So, and it's happened very rapidly. I know that operating out of multiple sites has been a fact of life for many of you for a long time and you're very familiar with the opportunities and challenges that it presents. For us, it's been a relatively new experience and we've certainly been thrown in at the deep end. Sink or swim comes to mind. In the last few years, we've gone from being a single site campus to a university with 10 study locations from South Bank in the South to Fraser Coast in the North. So that's our source of disruption. The nature of the growth that we've experienced has meant that we often have not had the luxury of a USC library or USC staff at a particular site when we've established it. So we've had to find a means of providing a quality service in a variety of environments. And this is where our innovation has kicked in. Each new site has involved developing different arrangement or model in terms of partnerships, infrastructure and staffing. We have co-located services in buildings that belong to other organisations. At South Bank initially, we were operating out of a TAFE library. At Gympie, we've co-located in a TAFE library with the cost of the staffing shared by TAFE and USC. We've had partnership arrangements of a different variety at Sunshine Coast Institute of Health at our new Sunshine Coast University Hospital. We have a wonderful new library. USC is one of four partners in that library and that library is staffed by Queensland Health um, staff. At Noosa and South Bank, we operate our library services out of an administration office staffed by staff members from other departments within USC. So there's a whole variety and each time we've had to rethink, bearing in mind our core services, but rethink how we've done it. By next year, when USC Caboolture is established, we will have acquired two campuses from two different universities in two years with the accompanying challenges of managing staff and student expectations, differences in institutional culture and distance. Add to this the challenges and opportunities involved in building a new campus at a whole new university. There's much excitement about the opportunity to build a library of the future, whatever that may mean. A shared facility that meets the needs of our staff and students, future growth and a resource for the community at Morton. Um, the whole Petrie Morton site is a very exciting thing for us, but, and I think perhaps is an opportunity for innovation of a different kind. So we have to decide what is it that the library of the future is, how do we make it meet all those needs and how do we bring it to fruition? So the journey continues. Thank you. <laughs> and sorry, and just a quick thank you to Megan Gribble who um, did the poster because I wasn't <laughs> clever enough. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. I think Sharon's the first person to have actually stopped before being... I told you I would. <laughs> so now we have Helen from James Cook University. We do have a little bit of time. Oh, okay. I've been allowed to go over time. <laughs> um, I actually debated for some time about the theme and what I could speak about and probably with most of the ULs in this room thought that there's a number of topics around disruption and innovation, including things like internal feedback mechanisms that we've developed and sustainable models for um, service delivery. What I decided to focus on in the end is the poster that you see here, um, which involved library staff across um, uh, our teams at the Marbo Library delivering this transformative program project, which is the T150 Townsville Past and Present Project. Um, and as you can see, this poster was developed by some of my staff there, Rachel, 
Amber and Bromwyn. Uh, in 2016, Library and Information Services, in conjunction with its project partners, delivered this project, which was a multifaceted, um, year-long special collections project with, at its heart, included Celebrating Townsville, which was a curated exhibition showcasing the university's art collection, which we take care of. So this was a bit out of the sphere of some of the normal things that we do. Um, it's an example of our community engagement initiatives. It's proof of our success successful partnerships with internal JCU academics, professional staff and students um, and external organisations. And the grant was worth $100,000, which included $55,000 worth of in-kind support. And a lot of that came from the Library and Information Services team. Now, as you can imagine, this did create quite a lot of disruption. It did present a great opportunity for us to reach beyond our usual audience, which is mainly our JCU community audience. Um, but it, in it, but we did have to deliver all parts of this project within a year and therefore we had to put a bit of a pause on a lot of things that we were doing in our special collections area. And so a lot of things that we had happening with our volunteer programs and our archives and accepting donations and a lot of other things basically had to take a back seat. We also had to rely really heavily on the passion of our library colleagues to be involved in this project and do this above their normal workload. So. From an innovation point of view, we were able to engage, educate, enrich on a much larger scale, um, exposing, promoting and giving context to the material held within our special collections. And it also provided us with a great number of networking opportunities. And you can see that on the poster to things like high school students and teacher networks, um, to our project partners, to local historians, to seniors within the community and to the Townsville broader community as well, and to visual arts alumni at JCU. So I found that a very enriching process myself. Um, internally, the many facets of this program involve library staff working outside their core duties um, to develop satellite exhibitions in the, lab, in the Marbo Library. I think we had one nearly every month. Um, web pages, graphics, um, gift cards, guides, templates around copying requirements, which Bronwyn will know was a wonderful challenge for us to work through. Um, grant application writing, which is a wonderful skill to have. Um, and last but not least, editing the exhibition catalogue and the essay on the art collection. Um, and this, this provided um, us the ability to develop a public program outside our normal core services and to expand partnerships and leverage our influence. So as a library, we've been able to um, create and curate a number of resources as part of that project. Uh, these were not incidental outcomes of the project, um, as one of the goals was to preserve the history of Townsville through the creation of new knowledge and information sources. I'm not sure that would have happened if the art exhibition had been done outside of a library environment. We've got artist archives and a number of other resources that we've been able to um, develop with that. Some of that's still ongoing now. And to finish, I don't think any of this would have happened without the support of the very talented um, library staff uh, that we have at JCU. And of course, that is one of our biggest assets for all of us. And without the blood, sweat and tears of our wonderful and unique special collections librarian, Bronwyn McBurney, who's in the audience today. So I'd like us all to thank Bronwyn. I would anyway. Thank you. I probably didn't go for two minutes either. <laughs> So the time's been a bit elastic. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. So now, now Kate Houston from Central Queensland University. Uh, thank you. I'm not a university librarian either, but I'm, I'm filling in for our deputy director today. Uh, so CQ Uni Libraries had quite a lot of disruption in the past few years and my colleagues might be tittering at the understatement there. Um, we had a major library restructure emerge with IT in 2013. Um, we merged with CQ TAFE in 2014, and we've got a, had a significant expansion of a number of locations. So um, what Sharon was saying is quite familiar to us. Um, we now have 24, maybe 25 locations. Um, you're never quite sure if another one's popped up. Um, and we have 15 library, like 15 libraries, um, and we have around 40 library staff, so um, not a lot to go around our 24 locations. Um, I'll just touch on a few of the innovations um, and that we've um, made to emerge as a library to try and um, strongly position ourselves 
in the university going forward. So we've transformed our client services from traditional um, campus-based services, location uh, based at um, the location servicing the students there, uh, to a virtual team structure across our campuses. Um, and we've implemented a tiered service model using ITIL principles. Um, frontline staff in our libraries are now able to provide level one IT support as well as um, library support. And um, librarian support to students is delivered through a virtual librarians online team um, with staff spread from Melbourne to Mackay. Um, all of our locations are now equipped with video kiosks for library and IT help. Um, and if you get a chance afterwards, um, you'll be able to see a short video um, which is hidden behind our poster um, showing the video kiosk. And the video kiosk goes straight into a triaged um, location where uh, queries are answered by level one staff or they are referred to librarians in real time. Uh, so our students, regardless of location, can access librarian help. Um, we also have a, a very large distance cohort and um, we also have regular online workshops and online help sessions that people can uh, join. Alongside this, our library spaces have been transformed to vibrant study hubs with new library design standards that we've developed. And this has been helped by a significant growth in our e-collections and a reduction in space occupied by print collections. And so there are visuals in our poster um, if you get a chance and if you're interested to look behind those. So I think I made it in less than two minutes. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. So next we have Barbara Payton from UNE. Okay. One day in September, the UNE Library was alerted to a significant emerging risk. Do we have any sound? Are you not putting a sound on? <laughs> okay. Um, the Dixon, if that this is the impact of what it was. Think apocalypse now. <laughs> okay. The Dixon Library Power substation and switchboard are approaching the end of their lives and plans are already in train to replace these. However, there was an increased risk of infrastructure failure that could lead to loss of all power in the Dixon Library. The next day, two floors of the library were closed to reduce the load on the electrical infrastructure. <laughs> there was ongoing risk of total power failure to the building. Safety precautions were put in place and a plan was rapidly developed to continue services and access to resources. The library staff ent entrance was closed, only the public entrance was open. The public lift was closed down. The staff lift was for use of goods only. No staff were allowed to enter the lift. <laughs> <laughs> Procedures for retrieving items from the collections on the closed floors were put in place. Staff retrieving items had to be in, in the company of another staff member. They were never to go anywhere in, the, in those floors alone. Mm -hmm. There was a need to be aware of where staff were at all times if there, in case there was a loss of power. So they had to let a colleague or their supervisor know if they were leaving the work area and when they might expect to return. Plans were developed for ongoing operations if power was lost to the whole building. Fortunately, more than 90% of our resources are currently electronic. We would operate services from the law library and extend law library hours. We would relocate library staff to other sites and to work from home. Library staff responded fantastically in this event. It was real. Four days later, there was a test of the, um, the load on this uh, infrastructure with all lights on on all floors. We passed. All floors reopened at midday on the following day. The library is now well advanced in the development of a business continuity plan for any such likely event in the future. <laughs> now, do so next we have Alison 
So next we have Alison from Southern Cross University. Pass the back. Another ring in. Um, I'm standing in for Kate Kelly, our director. So if you enjoy the talk, I wrote it. If you don't, she did. <laughs> Um, disruption often has negative connotations and it's associated with something that is imposed, unwelcome and maybe even unpleasant. But disruption also represents opportunities for us to be innovation, innovative, creative and to make transformations. At Southern Cross University, our Gold Coast and Lismore campus libraries have um, state-of-the-art commissioned media walls to, um, that are transforming the ways that research is communicated and delighting our communities with unexpected discoveries. In fact, we're calling these media walls discovery walls. Although the one behind me, or, oh, where's it gone? <laughs> the one behind me, um, my pet name is for it is 